right. Hello, I am Dr. Daniel Hall. I'm a licensed clinical health psychologist at Mass General Hospital and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. My research broadly examines uncertainty and stress and health behaviors with a focus on cancer and cancer survivorship. And I'm particularly interested in the development and implementation of mind-body practices and interventions for managing concerns like difficulties managing uncertainty. I, my research is supported by a K-23 award from the NCCIH, National Institutes of Health, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, as well as by funding from the American Cancer Society. So now I'm going to share my screen and speak with you today on the topic of fear and anxiety of cancer recurrence. All right. So I want to begin with a quote from American journalist and author Jonathan Alter, who himself is a lymphoma cancer survivor. And he said, the only constant in cancer is inconstancy. The only certainty is a future of uncertainty, a truism for all of modern life, but one made vivid by life-threatening illness. And this quote has really resonated with me as I've done both clinical work and research in the area of cancer survivorship. And it makes me uh, remember that to some extent, we all struggle with uncertainty and unpredictability about our health and our future. But there is something really um, salient about the diagnosis of cancer that makes managing uncertainty and unpredictability really uh, quite challenging for many people. And so this is the topic of today's discussion. After active treatments end, cancer patients enter a stage of surveillance characterized by uncertainty and self-monitoring, often faced with managing lasting somatic concerns and emotional challenges on their own. In 2016, a consensus panel established a common definition of fear of cancer recurrence, defined as fear, worry, or, co or concern about cancer returning or progressing. And along with this definition came features of clinical impairment in cancer. We now have validated screening instruments for use in clinical trials and current estimates are that approximately one to two thirds of cancer survivors have elevated levels of fear and worry about recurrence. We know that Younger cancer survivors tend to endorse these fears at higher levels, but work by our group and others around the globe indicates that fear of recurrence levels are similar across adults with different types of cancers. And also, these levels of fear don't tend to naturally remit over time um, unless they're properly managed. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that elevated fears of recurrence are common even 10 years out after completing treatments. Importantly, uh, fear of cancer recurrence does not seem to map on to established psychiatric diagnostic criteria. For instance, Ill illness anxiety disorder or somatic symptom disorder in the DSM-5. And so, we're forced as a clinical researchers to try to better understand what are the features of fear of recurrence that might highlight some treatments that may not typically be available, like they might be for established anxiety disorders. So I'd like to spend a minute now walking through a fear of recurrence conceptual model that'll help establish a rationale for really what we can do about managing this distress and concern. Recently, there was a meta-synthesis of 87 
qualitative studies that had conducted interviews with cancer survivors. And one of their main conclusions was that fear of recurrence was an intense, difficult, and multidimensional experience. Now, trying to unpack this, this multidimensional aspect of fears of recurrence, we know that there are at least seven published theoretical models of fear of recurrence, and all of them highlight the importance of physical symptoms, psychological factors, and behavioral responses in perpetuating a cycle of fear. And so what are some of the physical symptoms that can trigger these fears? We know commonly among cancer survivors lasting somatic effects from treatments or cancers themselves include fatigue and pain and these will often be appraised by cancer survivors as a potential sign of recurrence. In addition, we know that cancer survivors face um, psychosocial stressors at higher levels than people who don't have a history of cancer and so oftentimes they're dealing with greater stress and may even carry with them a greater allostatic load or a wear and tear on the body associated with having managed the stressors of survivorship. And when the body is in a state of the stress response, sometimes physical symptoms will heighten or get worse. Importantly, these physical symptoms are appraised or perceived to be a danger or a threat. And we understand now that cancer survivors who struggle more with tolerating uncertainty or ruminative thinking may be at risk for having more fears of recurrence when they're noticing these physical symptoms. Work by our group and others have established that fear of recurrence can also lead to emotional distress. At some times, reaching levels of existential distress, hopelessness, and demoralization. We also know cancer survivors who struggle a lot with fear about recurrence may have lower self-efficacy or feeling like they would be able to handle difficult situations should their cancer recur. And finally, this last piece is really important. It talks about health behavior changes that can result from fear of recurrence. We know that as a result of these fears, cancer survivors may seek reassurance by contacting their care providers or consulting information online about latest risks and odds and statistics. One of my uh, former, uh, one of our former study participants referred to this as speaking with Dr. Google. It's understandable, but can still perpetuate the cycle of fear by exacerbating vigilance and awareness to physical symptoms. Similarly, cancer survivors struggling with fear of recurrence may avoid signs of um, their health. Th that include things like annual scans or future tests or labs. And avoidance of this information could place uh, cancer survivors at risk for poor clinical outcomes in the long term. Finally, some of our research published just in the last few years has found support for fear of recurrence being associated with more physical, I'm sorry, less physical activity and greater alcohol use after cancer diagnosis, which again might be a way of managing these fears and worries, albeit not in a very healthful way. And so what can we do about it? We understand that fear of recurrence is multidimensional and includes these cognitive, emotional, and behavioral domains. Well, research has found that routine screening is acceptable for oncologists, for cancer clinic staff, and for cancer survivors. It's okay to ask questions about, are you worried about fear of cancer recurrence at their normal visits? We can also normalize and validate these worries as healthcare providers, right? We know that one to two thirds of cancer survivors will be struggling with these fears. And so if our patients are coming to us with these worries or concerns, we can let them know that this 
is a normal part of survivorship and we can validate that it is a distressing kind of fear to have. Um, but importantly, we can now provide referrals for evidence-based mind-body interventions that have been proven to be efficacious for managing these fears. And that's what I'd love to spend the next few slides telling you more about. So to manage their concerns, an increasing number of cancer survivors are utilizing integrative modalities that use holistic approaches for managing stress and anxiety and fear. We know that 77% of cancer survivors overall are utilizing mind-body practices. And this is taken from data from the American Cancer uh, that from the American Cancer Society's survey of cancer survivors across the country. We know that 48% of cancer survivors are using relaxation practices and to a lesser but still high level of uh, cancer survivors, about one third are using a sedentary meditation practice. And this includes things like mindfulness meditation and guided imagery meditations. To a lesser extent, cancer survivors are utilizing meditative movement, which is another mind-body practice that includes uh, practices like Qigong, yoga, and Tai Chi. We know that the highest level of utilization of mind-body practices tends to occur in the months and few years after cancer treatments end. And we also know that cancer survivors using mind-body practices are more often to have fears about recurrence than are cancer survivors who don't struggle with these worries. So what are some of the reasons why cancer survivors are using mind-body practices? Well, the chief reasons include managing risks of recurrence, to manage stress, and to increase their psychological support. And we know that among cancer survivors who are utilizing mind-body practices, there are a variety of benefits that have been reported, including reduction in stress, having greater hope, and managing side effects that can come along with a history of treatment. So over the last 15 years, mind-body practices have been integrated into interventions that specifically target fear of cancer recurrence, including a growing number of randomized control trials. But until recently, we didn't know very much about what are the characteristics of these interventions and what do they have to teach us about managing fears of recurrence using a mind-body approach. In 2018, my colleagues and I conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of these interventions that use some form of mind-body practice for managing fears about recurrence. We found that there were 19 RCTs that had been published with close to 3,000 cancer survivors, and that most of these studies were published just in the last few years, speaking to the growing interest in the cancer larger cancer research community in developing trials to help cancer survivors manage these concerns. We know that most of the trials to date have studied cognitive behavioral skills, as well as meditation, and to a lesser but still significant extent, relaxation and positive psychology skills. And what did we find about the treatment components seem to work best for managing fear of recurrence? Well, Across the board, these mind-body interventions yielded significant effects in reducing fear of recurrence. These were compared to control conditions, including inactive controls and active control conditions that provided some other alternative, and yet we still see these effects are significant. However, the size of these effects, the magnitude of the reductions in fear of recurrence, are rather modest. They're sort of small to medium sized, which is encouraging, but lets us know that there is room for improvement. 
we found that interventions with the greatest sized reduction in fear of recurrence tended to be multimodal, meaning they taught more than one type of mind-body skill, and they were delivered to groups of cancer survivors. We also, because most of the studies had tested either cognitive behavioral therapy skills or meditation skills, we can probably say the most about those approaches, but less has been known about the effects of relaxation training and positive psychology, just because there were fewer studies that had studied those specific skills. And after conducting this review, we were left wondering whether a program that incorporates a multimodal approach, teaching multiple mind-body skills, delivered in a group format, would be appealing and feasible for cancer survivors and maybe we could get an early signal that it might also be favorable in terms of improving fears and worries about recurrence. So over the next few slides, I'd like to share some of the research from my uh, research lab, developing a mind-body program that would be specifically targeting fears of recurrence. And I'd like to share with you not only the results from that preliminary work, but what we've learned from it and where we're going from here in terms of the future of fear of, fear of recurrence interventions. Okay. So my, uh, oops, my colleagues at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Mass General Hospital had developed a multimodal intervention that taught these very mind-body skills that we had found in our systematic review to be related to improvements in fear of recurrence, except this program that had been developed by the Benson and Henry Institute was not specifically targeting fear of recurrence. However, it was a wonderful basis for adapting our program. It was based on a theoretical model and has a treatment manual which is really important for making sure the intervention is being developed and administered the consistent way that it was designed. I'm, I'm sorry, consistently with the way that it was designed. We also know that this core program was eight sessions, 90 minutes a week, which mapped on to the average duration of the fear of recurrence interventions. Again, suggesting this might be a useful basis for starting to make adaptations for a multimodal program. And it's also been developed for working with groups of other patient populations and has been found to be helpful for reducing stress. So we, we started on a multi-step intervent, intervention adaptation process, which we don't need to get into all of the details for today's talk, but just to share with you, we started collecting data on our systematic review to better understand what types of interventions had been done already in this area. And we began assembling expert panels from people who had used this resiliency intervention called the 3RP, as well as experts in cancer survivorship from two Boston area hospitals, Mass General Hospital and Beth Israel Deaconess. In step two, we started synthesizing our findings from these expert panels and our systematic review to create our multimodal program. And then in step three, we developed a small single arm pilot trial that I'll tell you more about in just a few minutes. I wanted to share an example with you of where we took the original content from that multimodal resiliency intervention and made it specifically targeted to address fears of recurrence, again, based on our systematic review and findings from our expert panels. So for example, in the original resiliency manual, when we talk about teaching mindfulness in our adapted program targeting fear of recurrence, we talked about how mindfulness can be a skill for building tolerance of uncertainty and to reduce 
reacting to unpredictability with a lot of fear and perhaps more with a sense of curiosity and openness. In the original resiliency intervention, there were skills and exercises aimed at teaching participants how to notice signs that they're experiencing stress. And in our adapted intervention, we did something similar, but asked cancer survivors to identify what are the signs that you're experiencing fear about recurrence? Are there certain behaviors you're engaging in? Potentially consulting with Dr. Google or engaging in some type of avoidance. We also, in our program, taught worry time, which is a skill we'll come back to at the end of today's presentation as a way to reduce the impact of fear of recurrence on our day-to-day -day lives. Finally, in the original program, there was uh, material to explain the importance of social support and to help identify needs that could be met through communication and some brainstorming. In our adapted protocol, we specifically talk about oncology providers as a type of social support available to cancer survivors, especially for managing fears about recurrence. Okay, so in the third step of our adaptation um, process, we did a pilot test with a small cohort of four, um, four groups of cancer survivors, and we had three questions. We wanted to find out if we put together this program, would can eligible cancer survivors sign up for this program? Would they attend sessions and complete surveys? And really, would they find the program to be helpful? And we're excited to share that this, um, these results were recently made available online. And it was supported by funding from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at the NIH, as well as the Na National Cancer Institute. The participants in this pilot study were on average 61 years old and had been about a year out from completing their treatments. They were predominantly women and uh, predominantly non-Hispanic white, which um, again uh, is an area that we are going to be addressing in our future work to make sure our samples are a little bit more open and inclusive with respect to various um, participants of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. However, we did have a lot of heterogeneity with, with the type of cancer that survivors had been treated for, including survivors treated for breast, blood-related cancers, colorectal cancers, thoracic cancers, melanoma, and ovarian and uterine cancers. There was also a lot um, a mixed representation of the types of treatments that survivors had experienced. So we had a few a priori feasibility benchmarks, and we were pleased to find out through our pilot trial that all of our feasibility metrics had been met. Specifically, over half of eligible participants enrolled we had a um, high degree of attendance out of sessions. Out of the eight sessions, on average, cancer survivors were able to attend over six of the eight sessions. And only three out of the 23 enrolled were a low attender, were low attenders. We also found that at baseline, they entered our study, cancer survivors tended to say um, only 16% of this sample said that they were practicing some form of relaxation three or more days a week. And this rate increased to over 76% by the end of the program. Moreover, when we collected surveys one month after the program and three months after the program, we found that the sample that participants still were maintaining this level of relaxation even after the program had ended. 
Finally, we were aiming to have 70% retention at each follow-up assessment, and we had far higher rates of retention at 96%. In terms of acceptability, after each session, we asked cancer survivors to rate how enjoyable the sessions were, how convenient they were, what was the helpfulness of today's content, what are the odds that you'll use these skills in the future, and what is your overall satisfaction? And 87% of the sessions were rated as high or very highly acceptable. I would now like to share some of our survey data, again with the caveat this was a small sample. First, we uh, participants had completed measures of the severity of their fear of recurrence. And what you can see on the graph is that levels tended to go down and stay down over time. In fact, this dashed line represents a clinical cutoff. And so there seemed to be some signal that cancer survivors in this program entered at high levels of fear of cancer recurrence above the cutoff. And by the end of the program, this level had reduced to below clinical levels and seemed to be maintained over time. Similarly, we found improvements in reductions in the fear of recurrence triggers that cancer survivors in this program uh, experienced. They reported less functional impairment from their fear of recurrence and, and also reported having a greater degree of tolerance of uncertainty from pre to post intervention and maintained by three month follow up. We also asked cancer survivors to complete surveys rating their stress and distress levels. And similarly, we saw improvements in their scores of fear of recurrence related distress perceived stress, as well as improvements in their ability to tolerate physical discomfort, again, over time. And a final area that we had assessed in our surveys were their coping skills and their overall sense of resiliency. Similarly, from pre to post intervention, participants tend to say that their coping skills increased and they tended to use more relaxation and have greater confidence in their coping. Finally, we asked a resiliency item or measure rather, and these scores also tended to improve over time. Again, with the caveat that this was a small pilot study and we didn't yet have a control group that would allow us to figure out were these trends um, specifically because of participation in our program. So to better understand these trends of the survey data, we also conducted exit interviews. And cancer survivors tend to report in exit interviews that they um, had less reassurance seeking and improved health behaviors. One quote from a study participant said that, I was caught up in statistics and this program helped me get out of the statistical trap of triple negative breast cancer. Why am I really overwhelmed with the statistical business of some 40% of all breast cancer patients have reoccurrence and then you jump to stage four, you don't even go to gradation. So you know my head was just stuck in too much of this same sort, I'm sorry, of this sort of research information. Cancer survivors also discussed having some cognitive changes, including enhanced acceptance and focus on the present moment. One survivor told us, we may not even realize what we're doing. So pointing out these negative thoughts or pointing out how these can affect your body and trying to do meditation and imagery and all of these things is a tool. And yes, I think it is a great aid to somebody who has had cancer. I wanna share two more quotes. Cancer survivors in the program tended to report emotional changes that they noticed from the fear of recurrence intervention. One survivor said, you know, yes, I am fearful, but I have a good medical team behind me and that's what they're there for to help make it through this. So that's definitely the meditation, absolutely. And being optimistic about things. 
and also finding humor in things. You don't have to take things so seriously. Enjoy life and have humor in it. And also talk about gratitude. That helped me too. Like, you know what? Yes, I got a cancer diagnosis. I was very lucky that mine was curable. So I think this participant was talking about skills in the program aimed at promoting optimism and use of humor, but clearly this is an area for us to focus on in future versions of the program. Finally, there were some existential changes that participants in the Mind Body program reported. One survivor said, it's like I'm being defined by my medical history and that is not who I am. It's almost like giving too much power to cancer, which I really don't think I've got. You know, right now I'm letting go of that power. This is a chapter in my life, not needing to be how I define my life. It doesn't need to be my full story. So we, I, we learned a lot from this pilot study, including a sense that this was generally uh, probably uh, going to be a feasible and acceptable intervention for the most part. And through exit interviews and their surveys, the data seem to suggest some improvements, potentially yielding um, some larger effects on reducing fears of recurrence. But really, there are some needs for further adaptation in the future work in this area. Uh, we identified that, um, that there were the greatest improvements in the study tended to come from survivors who entered the study having high fears of recurrence. And so we uh, believe that in future work, it would make sense to target these programs to cancer survivors who are struggling the most with fear of recurrence. And that would be an important direction in the next version of the next clinical trial and programs in this area. We also know from some recent fear of recurrence interventions that it can be really helpful to conduct qualitative interviews with cancer survivors to better understand their needs and also their strengths. So one area for future work would be to interview cancer survivors with low fears of recurrence and try to learn from them. What are helpful ways of coping with uncertainty? What advice would you have for other cancer survivors? And then we can integrate that into the next version of our fear of recurrence program. Finally, we recognize that the, um, although attendance was very high in this program, that there were a subset of cancer survivors who weren't able to attend study visits. And also sometimes their late effects from treatments were reasons why they weren't able to attend sessions. And some of the feedback that we got also suggested that delivering this program virtually would be really helpful in the future. Um, in addition, in the area of COVID-19 and the pandemic, delivering the program virtually will make sure that we can continue to reach cancer survivors, uh, many of whom it wouldn't even be practical for us to do this type of group in person. So very briefly, I just wanted to share this slide to say to you that we do have a series of studies planned and currently in development where we are interviewing cancer survivors with low fear of recurrence to help improve and adapt this fear of recurrence intervention. And then we do have plans to test it in a randomized trial that we'll be recruiting for beginning at the end of 2020, where we will have a control group and we'll be assessing things like their healthcare utilization to better understand coping behaviors in the context of fear of recurrence. But I've been sharing a lot with you about these skills and I wanted to end today's presentation by reviewing a few of the skills that I've talked about in this research and to give you an opportunity to either practice these skills on your own or maybe to share them with patients and survivors who you're seeing in your day-to-day -day life or practice. So three skills I'm going to briefly review include minis, which will help elicit the relaxation response 
to reduce this fight or flight or freeze response that can come when we're experiencing fear and worry about recurrence. I would also like to teach you very briefly a skill called worry time. And this is meant to reduce the frequency and impact of worrying related to cancer recurrence. Finally, I'll teach you a very brief self ide or idealized self meditation, which is aimed to promote promote a sense of tolerance of uncertainty and to enhance self-compassion when you're noticing a difficult time, that you're having a difficult time managing uncertainty. So the first skill are minis, and this, and this comes from the Benson Henry Institute's uh, 3RP, Smart 3RP Resiliency Intervention, but they can be adapted for working specifically on fear of cancer recurrence. Minis can last as long, as little as one to two breaths or as long as five to 10 minutes. So one example of a mini is counting from 10 down to zero. And you begin by very slowly counting from your, to yourself from 10 down to zero, one number for each out breath. And if you start feeling lightheaded or dizzy, that's okay, just slow the counting. And when you get to zero, take a note and see how you're feeling. How would you rate your emotions? How would you rate your physiology, meaning your body, your signs of stress in your body and in your mind as well? And finally, if you're feeling better, that's great. And if not, you may need to repeat this many a few more times until you start noticing your physiological and mental responses are beginning to mirror more of a state of relaxation. A second version of this mini includes inhaling to the count of four and exhaling to the, from, to the count of four, inhaling counting one, two, three, four, and exhale counting four, three, two, one. And finally, you can also engage the relaxation response with repeated physical sensations. So you may engage in some deep breathing, but massage your hand, stretch and yawn, or do a gentle yoga pose in repetition as you're continuing deep breathing. And again, you can use these minis in response to fears of recurrence or as a daily practice to help reduce your overall stress levels and make managing fear a little more manageable. Another skill that you can use is worry time. This is a cognitive behavioral therapy technique to reduce the interference of fear recurrence on daily functioning. And it's been shown to be helpful for cancer survivors managing fear of recurrence in other trials, including the fortitude intervention by Dr. Lynn Wagner. And for worry time, you simply pick a 10 minute window when you can worry with having a minimal impact on your day-to-day -day routine. So you can do this when you're walking a dog, folding laundry, or doing some other type of routine exercise or task. And go ahead during the worry time and worry. You might worry about recurrence, uh, allow yourself permission to feel fear about what a future test or anxiety or uh, scan would, um, would reveal. But after that 10 minute window, try to utilize some relaxation skills for stopping, refocusing your mind, and then engaging on the rest of your day-to-day -day activities. If you're noticing yourself worrying at other times, simply remind yourself to put a bookmark on your worries until your next designated worry time. And finally, you might use an idealized self meditation. This type of meditative practice is drawing on visualization and includes thinking about optimism and the self of, and self compassion as tools that you can meditate on and foster a sense of efficacy as you manage uncertainty in your day to day life. So for this, you might assume a comfortable position, begin with a focused 
breathing exercise, noticing the breath going in and out. And reflect on something you might want to change related to your fear about recurrence. Then create an image of yourself that includes the changes that you desire, perhaps seeing yourself as you truly wish to be. And ask this version of yourself for advice. And then wait and see if this idealized version of yourself has some advice, maybe telling you to experience more patience or self-compassion, or giving you permission to follow up with the doctor or with a friend or co uh, coworker if you need additional support or if you're looking for more information. So these are three uh, really brief skills that you might use or be able to teach related to managing fears of recurrence. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I have my contact information on this slide. I'd also like to acknowledge our sources of funding, my mentors and collaborators, and my research team, without whom uh, none of this work would be possible. Thank you.